Hello, everyone. I'm Chris Goodwin with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. Welcome to this week's History is Lunch program, which is sponsored by the John and Lucy Shackelford Charitable Fund of the Community Foundation for Mississippi. We're in our home, the Craig H. Nielsen Auditorium in the Museum of Mississippi History and Mississippi Civil Rights Museum, and we're streaming live on both Facebook and YouTube. And if you've not already done so, please silence your cell phones. Thank you to everyone who was part of our fifth anniversary celebration this past weekend, and thank you all for braving the storms and the rain for coming out today for this, our final History's Lunch program of 2022. We are excited to have the fabulous Marty Stewart with us in conversation with Robin Dietrich and Karen Cronin about the making of the World of Marty Stewart exhibit that's on display upstairs through the end of the year. As a music lover, I can tell you this has been a really exciting time in the history of the department in these museums. There's uh, a lot of energy and uh, here to say a few words about this wonderful experience that we've had with Marty and his collection is our department director, Katie Blunt. Thank you, Chris. I couldn't be happier to be here today to welcome country music stars and our friends, Marty Stewart and Connie Smith, back to the two Mississippi museums. As you know, we have had the tremendous honor of hosting the World of Marty Stewart, an exhibit celebrating Marty's life and career and featuring his extraordinary collection of country music artifacts. Many thousands of people have enjoyed Marty's world upstairs, and it remains open through the end of the year. I'm so pleased to introduce Governor Phil Bryant, a great friend to Archives and History, a strong public advocate for the two Mississippi museums, and the man whose idea it was to bring this exhibit here. Thank you, Governor Bryant. With the University Press of Mississippi, we published The World of Marty Stewart, a beautiful book for sale, that is a companion to the exhibit uh, and features uh, wonderful, beautiful photographs, all the artifacts that you see upstairs, uh, great text, much of it by Marty, um, and tributes to Marty by uh, Peter Goralnik, Rick Bragg, and other notable writers. Joining Marty today in conversation about the book will be its designer, well, you don't see her yet, but you will, uh, Karen Cronin about whom Marty says, Karen Cronin is one of my dearest creative soulmates and collaborators. She designs from the heart and integrity is her guide. Karen will join us through Zoom, but also here in person is the managing editor, Robin Dietrich. Robin. Robin has worked with museums for more than 20 years as a curator, designer, editor, and project manager. She is an old friend of ours at Archives and History, having edited our book, also for sale in the store, um, uh, telling our stories, and curated an exhibit on the artist Andrew Bucci. You all know about Marty's spectacular country music career, but I wanna say just a few words today about Marty as a collector, an archivist, and historian. As you walk through the exhibit and leaf through the book, uh, the artifacts will stop you in your tracks. Um, you, you just will be stunned by Hank Williams' shirt, Carl Perkins' Stratocaster, Pop Staples' suit and guitar, Bob Dylan's hat from the Rolling Thunder Review. But what will also catch your eye are the other pieces, the photographs, the documents, and the personal items among the blockbuster artifacts. In the introduction to the book I wrote, Stewart knew intuitively that his story would be told not just by Grammys and gold records, but also by quieter items that reflect a full life intertwined with the deep roots of country music. Anyone would know to keep a letter from Johnny Cash that says, son, I love you and the telegram from Hank Williams' mother to his sister that states, come at once, Hank is dead. But he also preserved song lyrics, ticket stubs, and more. Not only did he save the mandolin that he carried to Nashville uh, on his first trip there, but he left the Greyhound tag attached to its case. Uh, he saved it all. That's why his collection is so rich and fascinating and so important. 
What an honor it has been for us to help Marty share his unique story and collection with the public. What a delight it has been for us to work with him, to get to know him, and now to call him a friend. Thank you, Marty. When the exhibit comes down, we'll miss it. Dolly's dress is leaving, Johnny's man in black suit, George's boots, uh, and the giant bronze Marty who has greeted our visitors in the lobby all year. But the good news is that the exhibit lives on in the wonderful book that we're gonna hear more about shortly, and the artifacts will travel back to Philadelphia and ultimately go on permanent display at the Congress of Country Music, the museum that Marty will open in his hometown. Uh, Marty and director Dan Bernard are already bringing some great shows uh, up to the historic Ellis Theater in Philadelphia. Last weekend they had Vince Gill, Ricky Skaggs, the Gaither Brothers, and more. Uh, so we'll see you all in Philadelphia soon. Now please welcome Marty Stewart. Thank you, Katie. Well, to begin with, I love this museum. It is such a great asset, not for our state, but just for the nation. Uh, there's a new Mississippi that is, I always see on the rise. The thing that I love when we have Country Music Trail Marker Commission meetings or any of the, any of the creative meetings that went into this is, the, is, is the, there's a, I've always said you cannot beat the fire of youth and wisdom the old timers and that is such a there's always such a great spirit of that in Mississippi about passing it on from the statesmen and the queens to the kids and so that's what's happening in our state and if you look all around our state um, there's there's a lot of people coming here for the first time that have read all the wrong things that have understood <laughs> things wrong and know, know only what they know that has been presented from a Hollywood point of view perhaps but when they come down here their hearts are captured mainly by the people. And when you get inside of the stories for real, uh, it becomes a part of people's minds and their hearts and their souls and their spirits. But this museum is a treasure chest to me of history, the ongoing history of such oh, a, a vibrant. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks, God. God. <laughs> Please. And um, so, Katie, uh, it just gives my collection even more credibility. And it's the tip of the iceberg. It's what we're headed into Philadelphia to do with our cultural center down there. So you have a forever friend here. And uh, the answer is yes, if you need me it's from here forward. So <laughs> we keep putting, I keep putting out coffee table books so I don't have to sit down and write a real one. It's, <laughs> it's coming. But in the meantime, um, I, I love the title, The World of Marty Stewart. It encompasses a lot. But um, to begin with, there's Karen Cronin. Make welcome from Nashville, Tennessee, Karen Cronin. Hello, everyone. From, from COVID, Tennessee here. <laughs> Hi, Karen. Hi, Marty. So, Hi, Rob. Uh, Hi, Karen. Since you were kind of the queen mother of this project, would you like to start it off on? It's, it, it started with me bringing a whole lot of boxes to your house. Oh, Take it oh from Oh, my there. gosh. Yeah. Um, well, it started with Marty bringing a whole lot of boxes to my house, and I regret not taking a photo of all these boxes because it was just crazy, and it kept growing and growing. Um, and I had to apologize. I didn't hear the beginning of any of your conversations, so if I'm repeating myself, please forgive me. Um, We're only beginning. But, I'm sorry? We're only beginning. Okay, good. Um, <laughs> Well, Marty and I have worked together for many years, and I was just counting the years. It's been 17 years, Marty. I don't know if you can believe that, but um, it's been a long time. And I just wanted to um, share my screen and show, if I can, show some of the stuff that we have worked on. Oops, I'm going to unshare my screen because it's in the wrong place. Um, Maybe, Sorry. maybe I can take this time to also explain myself while I'm sitting here. <laughs> Good. Please do. Um, so, yeah, like, like Karen and Marty have said, they've known each other for 17 years and have this amazing working relationship together. Um, but I was contacted back in 2020 by Cindy Gardner um, to, to work on this project and was brought in at the beginning of 2021. 
Um, I worked a lot with Sarah Campbell, who was the project manager for, for archives here for the book. Um, and then my role was also to communicate with the exhibition team a good bit to make sure that what we do in the book um, is a good reflection, um, represents what's happening in the exhibition accurately. Um, and as managing editor, I was tasked with coordinating and communicating all the contributors to the book, organizing the content. I was the liaison between archives, Karen and Marty, uh, secured rights to use images that appeared in the book, and Daniel Cook, who's here, um, played a big, big part in that. Um, and also communicated with University Press for the distribution agreement. Um, we had 10 contributing writers, including Mr. Stewart, who says he's not a writer, but if, if you have read the book, he is, he is quite the storyteller, um, and including Katie, who, who wrote the intro. And we ended up with something like 1,300 images in the book. Who are the other writers? Oh, I know. And I asked my buddies, uh, because I'm lazy, I asked my buddies to take, uh, we, we did this chronologically, from the Mississippi, uh, when I went to work with Lester Flatt, then Johnny Cash, and then when I became a country music singing star, uh, a, a, a chapter called The Pilgrim, I believe. But I ask writers, wonderful writers, to speak and do essays to introduce the chapters, and they are. Ken Burns. Yeah. It's a big one. Um, he wrote the foreword, and Marty knew him, of course, from the country music documentary, the PBS documentary. Uh, Peter Goralnik wrote the first chapter. Uh, Michael Streisguth, Holly George Warren, Scott Bomar, David Frick, and then Rick Bragg concluded. And we finally got, got Rick Bragg. <laughs> I love Rick Bragg. Um, and so, you know, it, each one told what they knew about best. Um, and so, anyway, I'm just incredibly grateful to be part of this project. Um, it could have gone horribly wrong with me coming in on this well-oiled team of Carrie, Karen and Marty, but I think we all enjoyed working together and collaborating. Absolutely. Um, but, but they were the driving force, so they're, they are the ones that you're going to be hearing most from today. We finally found our editor, because <laughs> Karen and I have trouble spelling, <laughs> and Robin is the best editor I've ever worked with. Thank you so much. Thanks. Ms. Cronin. I could not have done it without Robin. She really um, knew her stuff and kept me on track and kept my sanity sometimes when, um, again, Marty would show up with more boxes and that kind of thing. And I'd call Robin going, he showed up with more boxes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you, Robin. You, you know, you really kept this on track and, and helped to create this book. And I'm really grateful for that. Um, so anyway, Marty, I mean, just going back, I, I think I've got my screen share going here so I can do that. And, um, you know, we've known each other forever now and we've worked on quite a few projects. Um, let's see if I can clean this up here. So just, a, these are just a few of the projects that we've worked on. Um, lots of album covers, lots of albums, lots of books, a TV show, um, an exhibit in Philadelphia, photo shoots. It's just been a total joy to work on these projects with Marty. And I, I don't know, I think we've gotten to know each other over the years. And, um, you know, I, I um, you know, you push me sometimes in directions that are places that I don't want to go. And, and, and vice versa, I think. Sometimes I pull you back, don't I? <laughs> Absolutely. And I trust you. That's a big part of, of, of your creative team is trusting somebody. And you go, I have the greatest idea in the world, but if two other people look at you, you go, that's not the greatest idea in the world. <laughs> you have to surrender and go, I trust you. And so we've been through a lot of projects these days, and I totally trust Karen and Robin. I do. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's funny because, Marty, I don't know if I've ever told you this story, but... Um, years ago, when um, Superlatone Records signed with Universal South, and I think you had a three-record deal with them, 
-hmm. I was on retainer as a designer there. And because I was on retainer, I really had first dibs on projects. And I was going on vacation when Souls Chapel was just beginning to happen. And there was going to be a photo shoot. And I kicked and screamed <laughs> and I said, I am not giving up this project, even though I'm going on vacation. So... Um, the good folks at the label found another art director to go with you, and I, um, you know, I ended up designing that package. And I just knew that there was something about, um, I, you know, working with you. I knew there was going to be something deeper, and it was going to be a great journey working with you. And um, and I just wanted to be a part of it. And so that was really the beginning of it for me, you know. Well, and the, the other thing that I, I see up here is there's a record called Badlands up there, Ballads of the Lakota, and, and on our the set of our TV show, uh, down here it says the Marty Stewart Show, I'm standing in front of that same image, life size, and that image is a, a, a that's Chief American Horse, and it was uh, captured by Edward S. Curtis, one of the greatest of all the Native American uh, photographers, but Going up to Pine Ridge, South Dakota, where Connie and I have, we call them family. I was adopted into the Lakota tribe. And with, Connie and I got married up there. So that, they're like family. But I had a love for Native Americans all the way back to my days in the Shoba County with the Choctaw tribe. They were so beautiful to me. And, and when I was a kid, the Choctaws would come to the town square on Saturdays in traditional dress and hang around. And now if you go to the Choctaw Fair, of course, you see that. But the thing um, that I see up there, and I've said this, is that the thing that I love about being a part about country, about, about being a part of the family of country music, and Karen is so good at capturing this, and she has helped me define this, is it's not only a family, but country music has probably, arguably, done a better job of organically producing so many folk heroes. You have the man in black, the redheaded stranger, you know, um, who, who am I missing? There's a coal miner's daughter. On and on and on, these, these country music folk heroes. But the thing that the Native Americans and the country music tribe have in common, I mean, I look at that um, book, The World of Marty Stewart, that image on the cover, well, <laughs> uh, what what made it all right to me is that it goes back to Mississippi when I was hanging around the Busy Bee Cafe, which was a black juke joint, shoe shine parlor when I was a little boy. All of those black musicians had such a sense of personal style about them. You know, a lot of them were they wore flashy clothes, they played cool songs, and a lot of them had gold teeth, and that was my goal in life. They had a gold tooth. You <laughs> know, hadn't made that yet. But I look at Johnny Cash, the Man in Black, Connie, or Dolly or um, you know, the whole cast of the Grand Ole Opry down here, and what Marty Stewart, and what all those guys have in common with Native Americans is their individuals. And if you think about the larger picture of Mississippi, come on, Elvis, you can close your eyes, you don't have to hear his songs, you, can, you see Elvis in our, we see him in our minds, Muddy Waters, Howlin' Wolf, Tammy Wynette, William Faulkner, on and on and on and on. The spirit of individualism is what defined early Mississippi to me. And homogenization was not a part of the creative equation. And what Karen and, and Robin both have helped me capture is a sense of individualism and a sense of personal mission statement. And that's what I think makes art vibrant. It keeps it current. It's, it's, I want to know what you're thinking, you know, not what you're following. And that is the beauty of what working with these ladies has done. So there you have it. There you have it. When I knew, um, uh, one more thing, when I knew I was validated and looking so ridiculous, <laughs> Marvel Comics did a uh, comic book about me <laughs> in the early 90s. And it was, uh, I had a bloodhound named Oscar Lee. And so they loved Oscar Lee. And they came to uh, Nashville and we talked about a storyline. So the aliens came to the world and stole the great ring of country music. And me and Oscar Lee had to go into space and rescue the ring. <laughs> but what really finished the whole deal off was when it was time to kick off the comic book, they sent Spider-Man to help me do it. And we looked good standing there together. And Johnny Cash was a part of it. And I remember Spider-Man, every time you'd aim the camera at him, he'd go. 
he'd pose. And Johnny Cash watched him for a while, and John said he should have hung out with me in the 60s. I could show him how to crawl up a wall. <laughs> <laughs> but the spirit of individualism, there you go. <clears throat> Miss Cronin. Well, Mr. Stewart, I guess we have to talk a little bit about the book. Um, so uh, just, you know, the usual process. I mean, we, you know, we met, we had an initial meeting at the museum. Um, Robin and Marty were there and um, Sarah Campbell and Shane Keel, Madeline Miller, um, the team. We met and, and listened to, to Marty talk about what he was looking for in the exhibit. And um, from there, I, I listened to that and I looked at the artifacts. Um, Shane and Madeline provided an outline. Robin um, helped to um, put together a list of all the artifacts, and we went from there. And, you know, again, Marty showed up with his boxes. But Marty, I mean, you know, the book, you know, from when you and I talked about it, this book um, had to take the exhibit, the exhibit a little further. It really had the opportunity to, to tell these stories. Um, and so we really needed to tie these artifacts in with, um, you know, real life, you know. So, we, so there were documents, there were photographs. Marty was pulling things off his iPad, you know, photographs and album covers. And it just became this quite a large project. And at one point when Robin started, I even warned her, I said, when you work with Marty, things grow, you know. <laughs> and the page size kept growing, the page count kept growing, the number of images and everything like that. Um, and so, you know, I, I had to get organized. So I really just, you know, the first thing you do is you just put your palette down. Oh, let's start here, actually. So, <clears throat> Marty, you were an amazing person. And um, because you knew, first of all, you just, you were on this path. You knew it from a very young age. And this sixth grade essay, if uh, the, you people in the audience haven't seen it yet, it's quite amazing because it spells out Marty's life right there and from, um, you know, his sixth grade essay. And I just find that incredible. <laughs> um, That's how know, the whole book reads too, you know? I mean, it's, it's Rick Bragg. I brought a quote from his, it was his opening line of his essay said, um, if you made it up, if you wrote it in a song, no one would believe it. <laughs> and it really, I mean, it's Marty's story, but it's the story of country music. It's the way his story intertwines with the story of country music from even connections of, you know, inspirations way back to the Carter family all the way through, you know, currently performing. And um, yeah, so, I mean, Karen's talking about this, and Karen's going to probably also talk about his, his um, wherewithal to keep all of these things. Um, but that's what struck me, too, was just the cohesiveness of the story um, and kind of being amazed at how it all just came together like a fairy tale. I mean, I'm sure I don't know that it felt that way while you were living It was it, a nightmare but... sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, it was a designer's dream because, you know, there are projects that I've worked on that have not enough material to support the story. Um, but here, you know, Marty had kept everything and, um, you know, even down to um, the, uh, the bus ticket that he had, you know, that he used coming to Nashville when he first came here to, put, to you know, become a professional musician, really. Um, and his suitcase, which you can see on that spread that's, that's more white there. Um, and, you know, obviously toys from his youth. And there's that great picture of Marty with that little guitar and the, the boots and the hat. I mean, it's all spelled out right from the beginning. So for me as a designer, this is just a total treat because there's just so much to work with and really illustrate the story. And, um, you know, it was just amazing. I found things in those boxes that I hadn't seen. Uh, that, that mandolin was the mandolin I used uh, in the summer of 1971 and 72 
when I went on, on the road with the Sullivan family gospel singers, and there's a picture of us playing <clears throat> on um, a WLBT here on the Sullivan family TV show. We played um, at, at a Ford uh, dealership opening, but that was my first mandolin. And when I got a job with the Sullivans, my first year on the road was spent playing Pentecostal churches, camp meeting revivals, bluegrass festivals, and George Wallace campaign rallies. <laughs> and when I opened the case to that mandolin, I hadn't looked in there probably in 40 years plus, and there was a George Wallace bumper sticker that somebody had given me in there. It's like, wow, it's time capsule. <laughs> Crazy. Well, you know, actually, some of those boxes, when you opened them and started going through them, seeing what we could use, you would just get lost in the moment. I mean, you would be looking at things, you know, oh, wow, I haven't seen this in years and years. And um, it was fun to just see your reaction to that stuff. I love it. Mm hmm Yeah, really cool. So, again, you know, just editing, figuring out what stays, what gets used. That was all part of it how to put together the book. Um, you know, we came up with a palette of colors. Um, on the far left, you'll see there's, you know, colors. They sort of delineated different sections of Marty's life and career. Um, those letters um, were just kind of fun, big letters that we used. Um, Marty loves patterns, and so we brought in paisleys. We brought in roses, um, so you can see a few examples of spreads where the paisleys are being used, and uh, you know, and those roses, they were just everywhere, and even creeping into the photos, that drive-in theater photo, uh, you know, just kind of creating a continu continuity for the book, you know? And then another thing we did was... Um, we decided we were going to have section dividers, and um, each section divider would be a photograph, a still life of artifacts, again, because this book is tying into the exhibit. And we found a, a wonderful photographer here in Nashville, um, Sam Angel, and Sam and I went down to um, Jackson for about three days in September of 2021, Robin, is that right? Sounds um, good. I can't get my years straight anymore. <laughs> Um, but anyway, we spent three days with Robin and Shane and Madeline, and we photographed all sorts of stuff. It was really a very fun project, and Marty was not there, so what we'd have to do is, actually, it was kind of funny, Marty, we'd, Sam would send me a photo on my computer, and I'd have to take a screenshot of it, and then I'd send it to you. And you would, you know, ask to have an item moved or tweaked or, you know, that kind of thing. And we'd move it and, um, you know, until we got it right and got your approval. But it's just a sort of sampling of our three days. It was super fun. I like the uh, notebook here note that we had to send. We didn't have the notebook oh, yeah. in place. So that was um, that photo down there in the bottom right. That was for the superlative section of the book. And it's a collage of all the jackets. And it's just a mishmash of stuff because, you know, how do you get all these jackets into one photograph to look good? So we, you know, we played around and figured it out. And uh, we put this guitar in there. And that's in the bottom left corner. And you can see it's kind of weird looking. And so we photographed it. And Marty said, yeah, that looks good. And we took everything down, went to dinner, called it a night. And then Marty called me later and said, you know, I'm not really happy with the placement of the guitar. And this is after we had taken everything down and put it away. So that, that night I was like, oh, dang, you know. And in my hotel room I had to Photoshop a little layout. So that bottom left guitar is actually kind of a quickie Photoshop thing. And in the real photo, the, there's a notebook. So I just said notebook here. And I sent that to Marty. And he goes, yep, that's the correct angle. And so the next morning I came in and said, guys, we've got to put this all together. <laughs> and um, we managed to get it pretty close with the guitar in the right place. And it is fabulous. <laughs> uh, 
Let's see. And that's here's an example. I mean, these are the photos from that shoot. There were six of them all together. And Sam is a wonderful photographer. She's just sure. she really has a way with light. And Robin was in there tweaking images and uh, I mean art artifacts and stuff like that. It was super fun. Um, that was another, another example of of our team had not really worked together, but we just kind of meshed in the moment to make that happen. Absolutely. Well, you know what? I always say that um, anybody that I've worked with, with Marty, and he's introduced me to a lot of people over the years, um, just for album packages or the show. Um, everyone that I've worked with with Marty has been an amazing person and has gone on to be a friend. And um, so I knew mm -hmm. that you know, it was going to be that way with, with the team at the museum and especially with Robin. I mean, Robin and I are, you know, I think we're bonded at the hip now. In the, so it, he just brings this magic to even people and stuff. You're having fun looking at those photos, aren't you? I love it. <laughs> yeah. Well, what I love about your layouts is um, the one up in the upper left is, represents the Mississippi days. And there's the Lester Flat years, the Johnny Cash years, Hillbilly Rock years, Pilgrim years, and superlative years, which is now. And if you go inside of those photo, photo layouts, you can, if you look deep enough, it pretty well tells the story. And you get an essence of the story without even having to read the words. And that's, that's powerful photography. And Sam did a wonderful job. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You bet. She's great, really great. Um, we did another photo shoot in Nashville later Marty um, wanted his his road instruments photographed for the book as well, so I hired Sam again. And Marty showed up at our house one night with all these instruments and just said, "Okay, you can take these to the studio and photograph them." And it was a little nerve wracking. You could see at the top left there. Um, you know, we had a mandolin and four guitars. We had a hat. And again, Marty, this is a trust thing, right? I mean, you trusted me to to not um, drive off the road, <laughs> you know, with your instruments. That's Jimmy Rogers' guitar. Everybody yes, needs one of those in the living room. <laughs> <laughs> it was hard to give them back to you at the end, but yeah. So that's Sam. She's taking a photo of Jimmy Rogers' guitar over there on the right. And I'm not sure that guitar, that photo made it in, but plenty others did. And um, so, you know, one thing I wanted to talk about, Marty, is, you know, throughout this book, there was this emphasis of really tying in these artifacts and telling their story. And I really feel like we did that. Um, and, you know, there's a few spreads that I thought maybe you could just talk about. Well, that's just, I'll come back to that. But here's a spread, and this is the Clarence White String Bender, which is uh, one of the most famous guitars in the world. And th this whole spread tells the story of this guitar and how Marty got it. And again, this is one late night of Marty sitting next to me, pulling images off the web, um, and me going, oh God, Robin and Daniel are gonna kill me because they're gonna have to get permissions for all these photos, but they rocked it. We have a know? good story about that one too, that Marty doesn't Pardon? know. Go ahead. I the, <laughs> um, Daniel had the opportunity to talk to Gene Parsons um, about the use of the, the photo. And so he went back and forth a couple of times with him on the phone. And then the, the end result was, hey, next time you see Marty, punch him for me. <laughs> <laughs> That didn't happen. No. But. <laughs> this guitar yeah. is really, 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 really famous. It's one of the most famous guitars in the world, in the world of country music and rock and roll. It belonged to that fella up on the upper left there uh, playing it. His name is Clarence White. His brother Roland got me my job with Lester Flapp and uh, invited me up to come to Nashville. And um, Roland went on to be family. And Clarence, um, was developing this ugly guitar, but it's so unique. But Clarence, after a show one night, just, just to go out with him and his brother and play, 
was loading his guitar and his amp in the car. And a drunk driver came around the corner and ran over Clarence and killed him. He was 29 years old. And so, um, again, he was like, he would have been Jimi Hendrix. You look at those two guys, I look and go, how, where would they be now? They were such innovators, such musical geniuses. So the guitar was just nowhere. And his wife Susie uh, and their two children, Bradley and Michelle, continued to live on in California. And Susie was from Kentucky. And she moved back to Kentucky in 1980 to kind of start a new chapter in her life and put California behind her and all the tragedy. And again, we just took her in as family. And she called me one night and says, I have a couple of things of Clarence's I need to sell. That had, he, Clarence played with the birds. You remember the rock band, the birds? And so, um, so I said, sure, whatever. So I had just got a job with Johnny Cash and had more than you know two nickels to rub together. So I drove to Kentucky with Roland's son, and she told me what she wanted to sell. I went, absolutely, just absolutely. And I said, could I see this guitar? She said, sure. So she took me up in the attic of her house and opened the lid of the case, and it was a, the second string was missing. And I looked at it, and I couldn't believe I was looking at that guitar. And, I, and she said, that's the one you really wanted. And I went, what do you mean? She said, I said, anybody would want, want this guitar. So, honestly, if I got on the phone today, Douglas, you're a collector, what do you think that guitar would bring? Well over a million dollars. Over a million? Absolutely. Okay. And I think that's fair. I think that's fair, <clears throat> a fair assumption. And um, I played the guitar. She said, well, let me think about it. And so I went downstairs, and we had a cup of coffee. And later in the afternoon, she came in the room. She says, I've decided I want you to take this guitar and keep it and play it and, and protect it. I, I said, okay. And so my mom uh, worked at a bank, that bank right there, and I flipped open my checkbook and so she wanted to sell me this and a 1954 Stratocaster, some costumes, some birds paraphernalia, and I just shoved my checkbook in front of her and I said, within reason, put any number you want to on there. I don't care. If I don't have it, my mom works at a bank. I'll, <laughs> I, I'll cover it. And so for, for all of that, she charged me 1000 How much? What does it say? $1,450. And I said, Susie, you made a mistake. The first string on that <laughs> guitar is worth that. She says, I know what the guitar is worth, but you're supposed to keep it. And so that guitar is more famous than me and my band put together. And the first thing that uh, it did, it played on Saturday Night Live with Johnny Cash when I was mm -hmm. in the band. But it has gone on to be an iconic piece. And so that's, the artifacts are one thing. The story behind them is often the most important part of it. So there you go, Miss Cronin. And it travels with you. Yeah. Oh, right? when I first got it, it had, a, it had an advantage number on American Airlines. I'd buy it a seat. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Well, you know, and as you can see, this spread has all sorts of stuff going on. You know, I mean... Uh, Marty, someone sends you or someone sent you a sticker, that Frankfurt um, sticker at the top or, top left corner of the page. Um, that's the same sticker that's on the guitar. There's a little booklet there for um, that explains the guitar. There's pictures. Is that Nudie? Yeah, there's Nudie. Nudie his little stickers up there. Um, the top right of that page has a note from Susie to Marty about selling him the guitar. And the bottom right of the page has a picture of the check. And again, I mean, gosh, Marty's got all this stuff, and he just brings it in, and it all comes together in a, in a beautiful story on this page, you know. It's just really cool. And, you know, I, one of the things that I want to say is um, working on this project with Marty and really working with Marty in general, I have learned so much about country music and the stories that go along with it and um, you know I, if I wasn't a fan before which I was but I am a deep fan now because I just uh, have been privileged to hear all these wonderful stories with Marty sitting right here next to me you know as we work. Yeah. Connie has a great line she says and, and in her concert she says do you like country music? <laughs> and then she says do you like country music history? She said, you're looking at it. <laughs> True. Mm -hmm. 
Um, another example is, you know, just tying in um, the book with the artifacts is you can see Marty wearing the same jacket down there. And I think that was from 1991, the jacket. Yeah, and the photos from 1991 as well. So, you know, we just wanted to keep making this real, you know. Um, this artifacts are beautiful, but we have to make it real. Some sparkle and twang there. <laughs> Work clothes. And then another one, and I think Marty, this was a late night, and you know we got a little giddy here um, when we started working on the George Jones page. Um, and just a little background: this is you know um, Marty during his pilgrim uh, period and the section of the book, and um, you called the, these people your. Um, I'm spacing now because I'm cloud talking of witnesses. To a, cloud of witnesses. Yep. And these are people that just mean a lot to Marty and um, have been an influence and mentor and stuff like that. So this section has a lot of artists in it. Um, this is just two of, of that, two of the artists in that section. But each artist, you know, we wanted to show original lyrics. Um, obviously, you see the artifacts, whether they're a, a hat or a guitar or a suit. Um, and... Marty wanted to tie in album covers and photos and stuff like that. And I just remember, Marty, we got really giddy because of that green suit. And we kept finding more and more photos on the Internet. And, of course, I'm thinking, oh, God, Robin and Daniel are going to kill me. But um, I just love that suit. And I, I love the fact that he wore that crazy color suit. And it's very beautiful. And well, back to individualism, and George was certainly the king of individuals. <laughs> George would would put on a green suit in a heartbeat. And this 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 is a reflection of, if you weren't upstairs, a chapter called The Pilgrim, a story record, a concept record that I did. And I found a verse in the Bible that says, we're encompassed around by a great cloud of witnesses. And so I remember uh, calling upon George, Merle Haggard, Jimmy Rogers, Roger McGuinn from The Birds, Connie Smith, Charlie Pride, Johnny Cash. Uh, I'm, I'm blanking now, but Hank who? Williams. Hank Williams, thank you. Carter family. The Carter family. And we have artifacts upstairs pertaining to all of those people. And when I would write a song for the Pilgrim, in my mind I go, if I would play it for all of these people and have the confidence to play it, I know I have a good song. So the Pilgrim is about those people and artifacts and their lyrics and pieces of their lives that pertain to the cloud of witnesses, the eternal zone of country music. <laughs> and I think um, we're going to have to take time to take questions and answers. That's, that's it for my visuals. And um, you did good. I did it. I'm going to stop the chair and come back here. So, um, Chris, we're supposed to be do doing some Q and A now. Here right? comes Chris. I think if, I bet we have plenty of Q that y'all can A. Uh, if anyone has a question, raise your hand. We'll bring you the mic, and you can ask them right now. Got it. All right, hang on. Marty, how do you end up with George Jones' suit? Do you ask him for the suit? Does he give you the suit and all of this other paraphernalia? It's. A, I was one of those kids when somebody would come through Philadelphia. I would buy a record, you know, from their record table or whatever and say, can I have your guitar pick? I would, and it just it looked like important stuff to me. And when I was in Lester Flats Band and all those old masters, they would throw the set list in the garbage can. I'd say, and I'd just take it out. It looked important. And um, as I went on I, through my life, I developed friendships with these people. And it's kind of like asking your uh, grandpa, can I have your pocket knife? It's just a piece of him that you... You want to hang on to to remember Grandpa. Uh, these, a lot of these pieces I started collecting in the early 80s because nobody cared. They were winding up in junk stores in Nashville. The first piece that I bought of significance was Patsy Cline's makeup kit, hand tooled like a saddle, for 75 bucks at a junk store in Nashville. That seemed wrong to me. The same thing was happening to costumes, people's manuscripts, so I just went after it. I just went after it as a self-appointed mission to, to, to rescue some of those pieces of our culture. And uh, over the years, there's been buy them, swap them, you know, gift, 
uh, th there's a thousand stories, you know. And um, but that particular suit, there's a fella in uh, Texas named Billy Blakeman who's a fellow collector, and Billy let us have that suit. And uh, well, I think there were some boots up there. And his guitar came from one of his old musicians. Somewhere along the way, when times are really good in a country music band, and you're winning a bunch of awards and have a gold record, you get a soft spot and you look at one of your <laughs> musicians and you go, I want you to have my guitar. <laughs> and you can set your watch by it. 20 years later, it will be for sale. <laughs> the kids will sell it or something. So that's how I got uh, George's guitar. His old drummer sold it to me. Yeah. <laughs> Did you say that your mom saved all your childhood memorabilia? And I mean, did, is that how it ended up in boxes? Did your mama have it at home or? Hilda Stewart is um, a world-class gal. And as a mama, but my, my mother is my favorite photographer. So she started, she was a great documentarian to old Mississippi culture, just life around the house, raising kids. But Hilda is a, phenomenal photographer, but in her teenage years, I have scrapbooks. She would scour them in the show of a Democrat, and if somebody got married, or if there was a bad wreck, or somebody won a ball game, she was a basketball player, Mama cut it out and put it in her scrapbook. She was one of those that saved things, and I used to just pour over my mom's little photography albums when I was just a kid. I still have them. And uh, I think my love of that came from her. She originally, you know, was that. And then she got busy having kids and, you know, making a life and being a, a professional gal. But um, my love for that stuff came from my mama. And mama was good about saving stuff. It was disorganized, but she saved it. She did. You bet. Marty, how much fun was it working with Ken Burns on his documentary? And how do you think that that changed kind of your trajectory as being seen as a country music historian and kind of carrying that narrative? First of all, it was, it, was, it was wonderful. The Ken Burns people are absolutely the best, the best of the best of the best. They're smart, they're down to earth. Their little shop is in Ken's hometown of Walpole, New, uh, Connecticut, New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. And they work out of that little white house and do all those things up there. And the way it came about is Connie's son, Kerry, uh, was, came home one Christmas from Taiwan. And uh, on the way to the airport the next day, he spun around and he said, I saw Ken Burns on TV last night. And he said he was thinking about doing a thing on country music. And so I went, bingo. And I wrote, I'm a big fan. So I wrote Ken a letter, a fan letter. And about three months, I heard back from him. And about four months after that, there was a knock on the front door. And Ken and his producer, Dayton Duncan, came to the house when we cooked cheeseburgers and we played country music in the living room. And the next day, we went to work on that show. And we worked on it for eight years. And it was an absolute labor of love. And for what the last 20 years of my life has been about doing what we're doing down here, to hear that they were doing that was like having the cavalry come over the hill to help out. Mm -hmm. Because all of a sudden, the subject matter was lifted into the same atmosphere as the Roosevelts and baseball and jazz and prohibition and the, you know, all those things. that in, in, And instantly, Ken's stuff becomes curriculum. And it's timeless and it's evergreen. And the promotion of it, just the whole rev up, just to watch their whole machine work. But it was absolutely awesome. And I think it introduced um, him to an, a, a, I love shows where everybody wins. But traditional country music fan never thought they'd see that. And there was a, it introduced a lot of people to country music who had never given it consideration before. And now they're a part of it. I was certainly introduced to a whole group of people that had never heard of me before, but we felt it at the box office. They came to see more, and they continue to come on. So it was a win-win for everybody. And the best story, here's the best story, didn't make it in the show. So they, after, after they were at the house, a couple of days later, we were at the National Airport flying out to go do a concert. Here comes Ken walking down the corridor. I said, hey. So he comes over, we have a cup of coffee, and this good old boy comes up with a University of Tennessee shirt on, big old beer belly, and he said, Marty, how you doing? I went, good. <laughs> he said, I want to tell you, your music means a lot to me and the old lady. I went, thank you. He said, you got her through gallbladder surgery. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Anything to help out. <laughs> and then he says, um, 
you mind if I get my picture made with you? I said, be happy to. And this guy looks at Ken Burns. He says, Hoff, do you mind taking my picture? <laughs> <laughs> That's the best part of the show. <laughs> Marty, a while back I saw the uh, documentary Laurel Canyon, which describes in the late 60s all these musicians that were living out there. And I was kind of surprised there were some folks that, that really, as they were defining their sound, wound up being country music musicians. And you mentioned uh, in your career, you know, your relationship with some of the birds and so forth. I was wondering how much other genres of music, uh, you know, were you around a group of people as musicians and did different types of music uh, and interaction with those people uh, help define your style? Uh, well, to begin with, from the day I left Philadelphia, Mississippi, I was aware of my Mississippi legacy, the birthplace of America's music, and we can back it up. <laughs> if, think about it. Just think of the music that has come and continues to come from this state. I mean, everything's royal. It is, it is blue chip royal. And uh, so I left here up with an understanding of gospel music and the blues and rock and roll and a, a, pretty comprehensive understanding at, at a young age of the literary society that, you know, represents Mississippi. But, um, so I left town with that, and I was telling the story upstairs that Lester Flat, we worked one show that changed everything. Lester was just kind of a tired old Opry act, but we worked a show uh, during the days of deliverance, and, and, and the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band had done a record call. Uh, Uncle Charlie had Mr. Bojangle. So all these things were swelling and with a circle be unbroken. So all of a sudden, hippies and young people were gathering around, you know, the altar of country music and roots music. So Lester's manager wanted him to be a part of that. So we worked a show at Michigan, I mean, at uh, Cincinnati, a, a showcase, Lester Flat, Chickaria, and Cool in the Gang. Wow. <laughs> and we encored nine times that night. And the next day, Lester was booked on 72 or 79 college campuses. So all of a sudden we were rock stars. And that opened the door to so many different, you know, avenues of music, different musical personalities and different genres that just piled in on top of us. But the watchword there was authenticity. If you were an authentic jazz player, an authentic gospel player, an authentic rock and roller, it didn't matter that all of it came together, but authenticity and individualism again was was the watchword. And and so we, it was pretty cool. Uh, Marty, you and I were together out at the Rhythm and Blues Foundation Pioneer Awards in Los Angeles. That's right. And it attests to the fact that you do care about other genres of music. And you were telling me how much you loved Mississippi at that time. I'm just curious, did you get involved with any of those singers, uh, uh, of that, uh, the Drifters and others who were there that night? There was a, there was a, a record... <laughs> in the late 90s called Country Rhythm and Blues. And it was an MCA project that Don Was produced that paired country singers with rhythm and blues artists. And uh, they asked me, who, who would you like to sing with? And that fast said the Staples singers. Pop Staples and Mavis and Yvonne and Cleotha and Purvis. I, I loved them from the time I was a little boy. And you know the, the summer of 1964, going back there to, to those awful days in Philadelphia, "We Shall Overcome" was one song, and the other one was uh, "Uncloudy Day" by the Staple Singers. They sounded like ghosts singing in a cotton field, and I fell in love with them. So we did a suicide mission song called "The Weight," which they had done on the last waltz. But yeah, Pop Staples went on to be like you know one of my dearest friends, and um, remember Sam and Dave, Sam Moore, and so the. <coughs> The, the, probably the most enlightening statement of the whole get together, I asked Mavis Staples, I said, who did y'all listen to growing up? She said, you guys, you country boy. And I said, she said, who'd you listen to? I went, you. <laughs> <laughs> but it taught us that, you know, the radio was, you know, melted boundaries and records and music melted boundaries, but we all looked at each other. And it's the same now. I wish I could hug Muddy Water's neck. I wish I could hug Howlin' Wolf's neck, Hubert Sumlin one more time, Bo Diddley's neck, because, man, they were country cats, and they spoke. And this young'un over here, his dad was Mose Allison, one of the greatest jazz artists to ever come from Mississippi. But Mose, in all of his eloquence, 
he was still a Mississippi country cat, but he could take it anywhere. But yeah, I'm with you. You got it. <laughs> so these stories are fabulous. A lot of those fabulous stories are in this book. We have signed copies for sale over here. The stories are told upstairs in the exhibit. If you haven't been to it, you've got to the end of the year, but there's no better time than right now to go up and see that. Thank you all for being here today. We're going to take a break until January 11th. We'll pick back up with Charles Reagan Wilson then. Help me thank Karen Cronin, Robin Dietrich, and the fabulous Marty Stewart for today's program. <laughs>